Hello, um, my name is Maria Juliana Bick, and I am uh, the creator of a project called the House of Refashion. And today I'm going to be presenting a workshop uh, called Radical Care, um, Protest and uh, Change through social movements. And so um, actually, uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, telling you about the workshop, and then I'll introduce myself. So basically, the workshop um, has uh, three components. Um, the first will be I um, will give a kind of long uh, overview of the history of protests and social change through fashion. Um, and uh, in a PowerPoint presentation, and that will take about 40 to 45 minutes. Um, and then uh, for those of us who are in the uh, signed up for the workshop, um, we will be breaking into smaller groups and um, uh, developing our own uh, kind of social change campaign using fashion based on some of the ideas and techniques that have been used um, in the past to affect social change. Um, and for those of you who are not in the uh, WhatsApp, uh, I mean, in the Zoom workshop, um, we will be showing a short 30-minute uh, video, which will give a little bit of a background on some of the other projects I've done um, that are related to fashion and social change. Um, so, and then at the end, the uh, uh, campaigns that are developed by the people in the workshop, we will present them. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what's going to be happening in the next two hours. Um, and so um, one of the ones, one of the things that I hope really happens is that there will be um, some participation. So I really encourage people to um, uh, to ask questions, to make comments, um, and to participate. In, and I will, even though I probably won't be able to answer any questions during the PowerPoint presentation, once it's done, I will look to see um, if there has been any comments or questions in the chat, and I will answer them as best as I can. So, um, yes, so, uh, I wanted to start with a little bit of background about me, um, and then we'll start with the PowerPoint. So, um, yeah, my as I said, my name is Maria Juliana Bick, and um, I started out um, working in media literacy and social justice projects where I looked at the influence of media on our uh, living conditions and looking at the political, social, and economic aspects of um, our lives and how it's affected by the media. I So I worked in television and documentary and public media. And then I um, became more involved in community engaged projects and um, working it within communities, within neighborhoods, um, to um, understand what people were thinking about, what, what was important to people, and then um, create installations or videos that reflected back some of the ideas in order to uh, create more dialogue and to get people to engage with each other about the ideas and things that they cared about. So, and then most recently in the last three or four years, um, I've been doing a project that uh, deals with textile waste. And my, um, uh, the idea behind it is to raise uh, awareness around issues in the textile industry um, uh, and to help people make more sustainable fashion choices. But so, but also to and, and provide people with the skills and um, and techniques for doing this. Um, so I do creative reuse uh, workshops and clothing swaps. And then also I do a project in which we do public space interventions where we present upcycled clothes um, in uh, public spaces so that people can kind of see the results of um, reusing textiles and, and in order to encourage them to be more creative and to um, stop consuming uh, so many um, new textiles. So um, that's the um, projects that I've been doing. And most recently, I uh, published a book, um, which if we have time, um, depending on how everything goes uh, today, um, I will present maybe some images from the book. So um, uh, so let's get started with the PowerPoint presentation.
so um, the, as I told you, I'm, the title of my workshop is um, uh, Radical Care, Protests and Social Change Through Fashion. Um, and uh, so um, I want, uh, so I, I already gave you a little bit of a background on me. So this is that screen. Um, I already gave the uh, goals of the workshop, which is to create a campaign using some of the techniques that I'll discuss in this presentation. Um, so first, I thought it would be really um, kind of important to have a broad view of the history of textiles and fashion in um, in human culture and human civilization. And uh, so instead of it being some kind of a, perhaps what we might see as now is like a trivial or um, a superficial um, part of human culture, it actually was, a, is, and was a powerful and economic uh, cultural force. Um, and uh, we know from uh, the ancient trade routes of, for example, the uh, Silk Road, um, this was, as it, in the name Silk, it, it's, it comes from uh, textile, uh, 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 trading of textiles. Um, and so at one point, textiles were considered um, more valuable than gold because of the labor and the resources and time that went into creating even just a small piece of fabric um, uh, was really important. It was most likely the most important thing that most people owned, the most valuable thing that people owned. Um, and so, um, and the, the trade routes, uh, uh, like the Silk Road, um, these were the beginning of uh, the sharing of techniques, um, of technology, of uh, food, music, dance, all of these kind of were uh, began to share between various cultures behind the instigation of this desire um, for uh, textiles um, that came along the, the routes. Um, so, uh, also, textile production has um, and the time and space that it uh, uses. Um, this is also can be uh, seen as the foundation for mathematical and geometrical uh, knowledge. Um, fashion and textiles are e extremely public um, as well as private, so it kind of encompasses the realms of all of our lives. Um, it's very um, symbolic. There is uh, affinities and differences with messages um, along ideals, uh, economics, oppression, social status that are all embedded in fashion and textiles. Um, it's a way of expressing um, without words. Um, so uh, this is a, a quite a powerful uh, force. Um, and um, it also has been used um, and throughout history, which I'll go into um, later, as a form of a, oppression and control and a, a way of uh, maintaining the status quo. So, and finally, um, the, uh, uh, the weaving loom technology that was developed during the Industrial Revolution uh, created some of the foundations that we now see um, that have uh, created our digital environments and has made this possible um, to, for us to be uh, broadcasting on a, a live stream. Um, so, uh, so there's many kind of the history of textiles is integrated in many aspects of our lives. So, uh, and with that, I wanted to kind of read this quote um, from a book called The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity by David Graeber. And because um, I think it really uh, kind of integrates this, the long history of textiles with women, which will also be a, a theme that comes up in these, uh, some of the social change and protests, protests that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, in uh, the presentation. So, um, so, but where evidence exists, it points to strong associations between women and plant-based knowledge. As far back as one could trace such things, by plant-based knowledge, we don't just mean new ways of working with wild flora to produce food, spices, medicines, pigments, or poisons. 
We also mean the development of fiber-based crafts and industries, and the more abstract forms of knowledge these tend to generate about properties of time, space, and structure. Textiles, basketry, network, matting, and cordage were most likely always developed in parallel with the cultivation of edible plants, which also implies the development of mathematical and geometrical knowledge that is quite literally entwined with the practices of these crafts. So I just thought that that was uh, an interesting uh, quote to, to bring to the table when talking about the history of textiles. Okay, so um, the first example that I want to give is um, uh, that uh, the Queen uh, Hatshepsut of um, Egypt. She was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of 18th of ancient uh, Egypt, and the second woman to rule as the king of both Upper and Lower Egypt, and she reigned for 21 years. Um, and so. Um, one of the things that she uh, did is she ruled as a man um, and she made efforts to legitimize herself in the role um, by leading military expeditions and expanding trade um, and that she uh, usually dressed in the typical attire um, worn by male kings. Um, so here we have a picture of her, and we can find out that there are um, uh, depictions of her that range from a female form uh, adorned with male clothing and accessories, um, and in paint. But then there are also paintings and statues of her as a physical a male being, um, and uh, with a man's chest and build, and in including her beard. And she wore a fake beard, um, which was a tradition of the pharaohs. But this was a way of her as a woman to assert her power and define herself as a ruler. Um, and so fashion, um, this is the first instance of example of um, a fashion uh, being used as a way to claim power and to stake out identity. Um, and as we will see later on, this is uh, used by women and, uh, and other people who are advocating for their rights um, and to have access to power um, uh, have been used uh, using fashion. Um, so uh, the second example um, is uh, uh, an ancient Greek play um, called Lysistetra. And um, in this play, um, the uh, women use clothing or more lack of clothing as a way to um, strike against men in order to stop the Peloponnese War. And so by dressing up or dressing down, as you might say, um, to having no fashion um, as a statement, um, they uh, they were able to advocate for uh, what, something that they wanted to see, which was the end of war. And by withholding, um, so they also uh, withheld sex. So this was, uh, a, they used this as a powerful tool. So, um, uh, so that's the second example. And then I wanted to kind of um, look a little bit at the um, social distinctions um, and social control that has been uh, exerted through um, fashion. And so um, one of the examples I wanted to give was the, um, uh, this flat cap, which was um, came, uh, which was regulated um, for poor men in England. And it was uh, used as a, um, a, a way to stimulate the uh, wool industry, um, but also to kind of set social classes. And so um, a, a, a poor man was not allowed to dress as a rich man. Um, and so in uh, England in 1571, there was an act of parliament um, to stimulate the domestic wool uh, consumption. Um, and it, so it dictated that on Sundays and holidays, all men over the age of six, um, uh, except for nobility and persons of degree, um, were, a, were needed to wear um, this wool cap 
And if not, they would get a fine um, for, for every day that they didn't wear this wool cap. And so um, this uh, is uh, instituted the flat cap. This is a very old version of the flat cap, um, but it's still, uh, you, you can see this um, uh, a style of this hat that's still popular today, um, especially in, 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 in Northern England and Scotland um, and Ireland as well. Um, and so, um, it, but it, it became a, a way of fashion becoming a, um, a setting of social classes and uh, uh, social control. Um, so, and so the flat cap now is still, um, associated with tradesmen and apprentices. Um, so um, then um, since uh, at that time also, there were many dress codes um, that became more and more strict um, and they were used to maintain specific social roles and hierarchies. And so there was laws, sumptuary laws um, that were drawn up by city officials um, that were uh, define the types of clothing that people could wear. So the, uh, the type and the quality and the quantity of items that each social group was allowed to wear. So along the lines of nobility, of the church, um, of the working class, everyone was defined by their clothes. And um, it was illegal to um, wear clothes that were outside of your rank. So of course the nobility would uh, were able to wear silk gowns and velvet trims on their hats and their gloves and and uh, uh, jewelry um, was all kind of dictated um, by the law and so the low ec economic status individuals um, and families were forbidden to wear these um, expensive and prestigious garments. Um, so, and also some of the colors, sometimes the colors that people are allowed to wear um, were dictated. So like reds and purples um, and silks and velvets um, were only uh, uh, allowed to be worn by the elites. Um, so uh, uh, then we also have for the men, um, the men uh, had more uh, cooler skirts and uh, huge cuffs um, and uh, very puffy breeches and all of this um, uh, in the, uh, the men's uh, slowly as um, people started to rise up uh, for their rights. Um, uh, and these, uh, after the French Revolution, these, these types of ex excessive finery became less and less acceptable. Um, so uh, through this social change, the fashion also changed. So, and this I, I want uh, brings me to the the, the businessman suit. Um, and so, um, as you saw in the previous slide, the um, the clothing that the royalty wore um, was very excessive, very uh, large, with lots of adornment or lots of. Um, uh, uh, embedded jewelry and um, embroidery and very expensive and labor intensive um, uh, garments. Um, and so uh, in the early 1700s, the high status of most European society was uh, opulent and endured with things like brocade and jewels. And this was true for both men and women. And this uh, type of clothing signified their status in aristocratic rank in a high place in society. But the um, American Revolution changed that, um, mostly for men. And as we'll, we'll see um, later on, uh, uh, and what happened was that the, uh, the clothing became much more um, uh, conservative because all of the adornment um, was seen as affiliating with the, um, with the nobility that uh, went out of fashion, should we say, um, during the French Revolution in which a, a, a lot of them were um, killed <laughs> with the guillotine. So I shouldn't be laughing, but anyways, that's what happened. <laughs> so um, uh, so in the um, age of enlightenment, um, the, they slowly, in order to uh, kind of uh, distance themselves from the stormy opulence, it, it actually became quite uh, uh, dangerous for people to wear any kind of the clothing that was uh, previously associated with the aristocratic class. Um, and so um, uh, 
because um, people were being accused of affiliations with the aristocratic class and, and being taken to the guillotine. Um, so uh, the French society um, began to ref uh, reflect these enormous changes in their, uh, in their social and uh, cultural and political structure. Um, uh, and so all of that had been, what had been popular before was now out of style and it was only became a symbol of the hated old system. Um, and so um, they it started to uh, borrow um, fashions um, that were more simple. So uh, from Britain and from ancient Greece, both societies that were uh, seen as um, more democratic than the French society. And so the um, uh, British country clothing with the, uh, the long um, jackets and leather boots became more popular. And so you can see um, how the here on the screen, the, the styles became more kind of fitted, um, and less adorned, um, and uh, and also for women, this also happened in which the the uh, women's dresses became more like uh, uh, more uh, tunicky, um, and um, uh, were simpler. And this was in association with the ancient Greeks, um, which uh, is the birthplace of democracy. So um, so this wearing of a more democratic clothes. Um, uh, so that everyone had the same look, um, regardless of social status, um, it reflected the values of this new era, which was sensibility, rationality, and equality. Um, so, and there was this renunciation of, of all the opulence of the jewels and brocade and all that. So, um, let's go to the next slide. And also, it should be said that all the, the, the laws of who could wear what, um, you know, uh, that royalty could and, and um, the church could wear some more kind of elaborate and silks and velvets, um, all of those uh, laws were um, uh, taken away. Um, and so um, uh, everything now it was more um, equal in what people could wear, people could wear what they wanted. So, and then, so you can see here the kind of um, progression of uh, the businessman suit. And um, so um, you can see, and now we know um, that the businessman suit has become a, uh, a new symbol um, of kind of business and corporate power, political power um, that um, has evolved over time, but, um, for a long time, it was seen as a, a, a more uh, equalizing force. Um, uh, so it's interesting to see how this, this suit has evolved over time and, and, um, and kind of paralleled different social movements and political, as well as uh, uh, economic changes. So I, I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about um, actually the first project that I did, which was um, uh, called uh, Refashion for a Post-Capitalist World. And um, how this came about is that I was uh, working in a free shop, um, providing uh, uh, donated clothing to anybody in need, mostly to support um, uh, displaced people, um, asylum seekers and refugees who are arriving in Athens. Um, but also we were open to everybody, to homeless people, anti-consumerist people who um, wanted uh, and needed um, uh, clothing, but didn't want to participate in the, um, the consumption of the um, current uh, textile industry. And um, so this, uh, in these free shops, in the free shop that I was working at, um, we started to notice that the pile of businessman suits um, was growing bigger and bigger and um, uh, nobody wanted it. Uh, it was, uh, the, you know, um, not even business people want to wear business suits anymore. Um, uh, and so, but the, the textiles were super um, uh, uh, high quality. 
So most of the suits were had super intricate um, uh, uh, linings and tailoring, and they were made of uh, high quality wools and silks. Um, of course, the, the tie was made of 100% silk. The shirts were often made of 100% cotton. And it was quite a contrast to most of the materials we see available now. So I decided to take the businessman suit and transform it into a um, a different kind of fashion statement um, as a symbolic kind of turning around of this symbol of power um, and capitalism um, and making it into something new. And so you can see an example of that. And also if you watch the video that's coming up um, there, you can see um, what that fashion show looked like. Um, so, uh, so, and it was uh, oh, this, it was kind of, just to get back to this, um, the, it was kind of a show of um, kind of how things, how fashion can be used to raise awareness and to instigate change and to think about things in a new way and to show things differently. So um, that was the idea behind that. So um, jumping back into history, um, I wanted to mention another um, uh, fashion um, movement, which was the Incroyable and Marius um, that emerged in um, uh, uh, France after the French Revolution. So these were, this was a group of youth that I think um, came, uh, or actually I should read this um, statement because it it's, uh, kind of sums that up a little bit. So in the uh, 1790s, a uh, band of Parisian youths emerged, and they had weird haircuts, they spoke with funny voices, and roamed the streets getting into trouble. Um, they walked as if they were hunchbacked, um, and they uh, wore fashion that was extended, um, padded, and pulled the body out of proportion um, with coat, uh, the coats cropped um, under their chest in front of the um, and rears and um, almost brushing the floor. And so they, as they are described, this is, is a very kind of over exaggerated look. Um, and they made their political statement by dressing in outlandish fashions um, that exaggerated and mocked the luxurious styles that have been worn by the, uh, the court of Louis um, the 16th. So, um, this is the um, this is the uh, the um, uh, kind of first protest fashion movement that I came across, um, and it uh, was both men and women who worked together, and it was really kind of a. Um, uh, a response to the French Revolution and um, the use of the guillotine to shape a republic of virtue, um, and it result which resulted in the death of seventeen thousand people um, uh, by the guillotine, um, and it was very there were very broad executable offenses, um, and so any uh, individual that showed um, themselves to be supporter of the tyranny and the, um, were considered enemies of the state, um, so they, they would be in danger. So, but this movement, this rebellious youth movement, um, uh, was kind of came up because it was pitting the poor and the middle class against the wealthy and the government was very unstable. So the men and the women who joined this movement, um, where they made their um, a statement um, by ridiculing the extreme fashions. Um, and uh, so they had like kind of a healthy um, gallows humor and they frequently had hair that was brushed forward and shaved at the nose of the neck um, to kind of as if it was ready for the guillotine. Um, and um, they, uh, oh, wait, sorry, oh, change the page. Um, uh, they also had victims' balls, um, and the the women um, wore transparent dresses. Um, reminiscent of the underwear, and also they tied red ribbons around their necks, um, around their throats to suggest uh, decapitation. Um, and the, um, 
they also exaggerated the Greek style, um, more democratic wear that had been introduced, um, but they made it very sheer so that they were almost transparent. And you can see that here in this this image um, that they and sometimes they even wet the cloth in order to make the clothes more clean and dressed to their uh, 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 kind of up against their bodies, more revealing. Um, and so, and they also uh, um, addressed the ostrich feathers um, and they wore a lot of um, heavy perfumes. Um, so, and then uh, for the men, um, they were also, they were named the Encryable because they looked incredible and they wore a kind of a cartoon version of the English country suit. So basically what they were doing is they were poking fun at the more kind of democratic clothes of the tunic dress and the um, English uh, um, uh, suit, country suit, um, but making it into these exaggerated statements with the extremely tight uh, pants and short vests. Um, and um, you know, made of flowery fabrics. And so um, they even had like their sleeves were so long they hid their um, hands for sight and their um, the lapels were so large that they often stuck up um, several inches above the, uh, the wear. So they became super exaggerated. Um, and all of this was like, they had raggedy haircuts um, and they wore large um, uh, hats, uh, uh, big cornered hats. Um, and so um, slowly when uh, Napoleon Bonaparte rose to power, this style kind of became um, no longer acceptable. Um, but it was a, a quite a humorous and rebellious style that emerged in the, the wake of this very kind of huge social change. So, um, and, and I wanted, I, I see this and I think other people do also they, as a kind of a precursor to punk and some of the exaggerated styles that are made to kind of disassociate people um, from the status quo, from the cer uh, certain social uh, changes that are happening and to make a statement about it through their clothing. Um, and so there is other uh, movements that have been defined um, in part uh, through their clothing. So it's uh, so we have the teddy boys, the mods, rockers, the disco time, um, yuppie, uh, preppy, the hippies, uh, candy ravers, goths, all of these are um, kind of social movements that are um, identifying I with uh, ideals and making a statement through their clothing. So, um, and this all, all happened at the same time when there was this huge transition of um, kind of uh, cultural and social um, uh, ways of being. So here we have a picture of the punks and you can see their, um, their, uh, they, their rebellion um, and, and uh, the other rebellion of these uh, youth movements, um, it pushes people to use uh, clothing to um, provoke and agitate and um, to become more visible. Um, and ra rather than blandly anonymous, um, it's, a, it's showing this power of otherness um, and as a tool of protest. Um, it's a single signals a nonconformity um, through the clothes, um, making a visible statement against prevailing norms and um, power structures. And so in the punk era, this was done by using um, used clothing repurposing used clothing, um, uh, using safety pins and tartans. Um, and they, they you know, distinguished themselves and created affinities among themselves with the clothes. Um, and uh, so um, this extreme fashion was, uh, it was a way of uh, uh, kind of creating a group of being together um, and to broadcast their dissent in times of crisis. And this was, this um, happened in, uh, in England, the time when uh, economic conditions for the working class were becoming quite um, uh, difficult. And so this was a way of people kind of instigating um, their um, kind of resistance to that and, um, and instigating some kind of different kind of power on the streets. 
and, and this was during the time of the recessions in the um, early 1970s, alongside some of the oil crisis and other changes that also happened through Thatcher and um, uh, Reagan eras in which the neoliberal agenda became much more um, powerful. Um, so, so that's one social movement that is directly connected to the incroyable mesures from the uh, French Revolution time, post-French Revolution time. Um, and uh, so another movement is the hippie movement, um, which was also um, tied to um, uh, the the social change, and this was in the 60s. Um, and, and this came at a time when uh, fashion houses um, were usually designing for uh, mature and elite members of society. Um, uh, but there was this, as we most of us know, there was this huge political revolution that transpired um, and that the power of teenage and young adults um, on the market became more power, uh, more clear. And so it was hard to ignore. And so this fashion um, became, it kind of came out of the 50s where the clothing was quite conservative, what men and women could wear. The men were wearing the suits, the women were wearing skirts um, and uh, tight-waisted, um, uh, like almost, almost corseted, but not quite the corset. Um, and so there, out of that came this loose, flowy, colorful um, uh, styles. So um, yeah, so this is like the uh, counter-cultural movement working against the um, mainstream ideas um, of uh, that had, uh, you know, people associated with the militarization that led to the Vietnam War. Um, all of these things were counteracted through the clothing that, um, that people chose. And it, it was a way of them expressing their ideals. And just to give you a context, um, so this, uh, the Jackie Kennedy um, and her uh, pillbox hat and her very kind of streamlined suits and her white gloves and her little hat purses, this was the, the more, um, kind of common, um, acceptable way for, for women and men to dress. And so um, you can see the contrast with, with the hippie movement. Um, and uh, so, and actually, I don't know if you know about the, I've seen the Mad Men um, television series, but this, this whole transition in society is documented. Um, and so, uh, thought it would be uh, good to show how this social change uh, also expresses itself through um, the clothing. So now I'm gonna jump back again um, in history because all of these kind of movements and ways of uh, politics um, and uh, textiles and fashion have been used are so interwoven. I'm kind of jumping back and forth um, to show the connections in the best way I could figure out. So hopefully it's not too confusing. So um, going back to um, the uh, European um, men uh, 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 abandoned this uh, draped attire, um, and but the women remained draped below the waist um, until the early 20th century. Um, so women as where didn't participate in the evolution towards egalitarian norms until much, much later. So as we know, um, the men's uh, suits became more practical, but uh, the women continued to wear the corset and the huge kind of heavy layers of skirts, um, which hindered their movement um, and uh, became um, kind of a, a, in, in a way of expressing uh, the women's kind uh, uh, accepting of the social statuses um, and this kind of oppression of the body through fashion. Um, so, um, but through women's uh, emancipation movement, they used fashion. Um, for, for one thing, they wore white um, in their demonstrations to bring them together and to provide a cohesive identity on the marches. Um, they wore the uh, very, um, uh, their Sunday best um, as a way of establishing themselves as a full citizens with rights. Um, uh, they made handmade banners um, as a way to kind of bring this womanly um, uh, uh, craft into the public as a way of as a, a way of to reclaim 
to claim their rights. Um, and then also um, it became more popular um, to wear bloomers, which is basically pants, long billowy pants, that was uh, to make a, a statement against the restrictive clothing of the corsets and the heavy layers of long skirts that most women, all, all women were uh, dictated to wear by the social norms. Um, so there came the dress reform movement, um, which, uh, whoops, sorry, um, which uh, was um, uh, instigated to kind of liberate the, uh, the female body and resist against these very restrictive fashions. Um, and also to uh, pr pr uh, give a way for women to have more masculine freedoms and a way of having a more masculine assertion of power. Um, so um, up until then, it was actually often uh, illegal for, uh, for women to wear uh, men's clothing and vice versa for men to wear women's clothing. Um, and so this is uh, where we, uh, some of the very strict gender binaries that we have now came from this regulation of uh, what women and men could wear. Um, and so um, uh, what, um, so I, uh, yeah, <laughs> so, um, sorry, I'm getting a little lost in here. So, um, yeah, so the dress reform movement, um, they wore these full cut, um, uh, pantaloons or Turkish trousers, um, and a short skirt, um, and, uh, it, although it, uh, the bloomers were named after Amelia Bloomer, um, but uh, it, it was not because she initiated them or invented them. They're actually Turkish trousers, but um, because of an article that she wrote um, that advocated for them as a, as a form of liberation for women and uh, uh, women's rights. Um, and so... Um, so, uh, so there was this movement that started to identify fashion and um, and uh, clothing um, with uh, social change. So here we can see the suffragettes, um, and they were all uh, wearing white um, as a as a visual um, symbol and to create a, a unified um, force. Um, and you can see a little bit of a side here of um, some of the handmade banners that they made. Um, so. Um, uh, the color was uh, also um, chosen to kind of counteract this white chastity image and to um, take it and subvert it. Um, and to um, also, it in, um, because they knew that they would be printed in black and white um, in the newspapers, the pictures that they knew that this, uh, the visual power of having these uh, this white mass um, would be very powerful visually. So this is also the beginning of thinking about how to um, use media as a form of uh, integrated in a social protest campaign and um, to raise awareness about issues. Um, so this is another thing that we, we should think about when we're um, uh, developing our campaign. So, um, uh, so oh, also uh, white was used by the women, but also there was a march um, by uh, uh, the um, NA, uh, NAACP um, in New York, known as the Silent Protest Parade, um, which took place um, following uh, violent attacks of the black community in East uh, St. Louis, where, um, and so nearly uh, 10,000 uh, black men, women, and children uh, silently walked down uh, Manhattan's Fifth Avenue. Um, and so they also took uh, white as a symbol um, for their protests. And we can see this now um, in the, um, in a demonstration that happened in the June of 2020, um, when 15,000 people um, went to the Bronx, uh, the Brooklyn Museum um, for the Black Trans Lives Matter. Um, and because there was, um, uh, after multiple uh, killings of Black trans uh, people, um, they came together to honor their lives and they also used white 
as this way of building community and making a visual impact on the streets. Um, so we can see how the use of color um, has been an important part of social change and social uh, protests. So um, uh, then uh, I wanted to uh, quickly jump back again in history to talk about the shirtwaist strikers because this also relates to the textile industry and in that there um, was Oh, I missed a zero here. There's 20,000 women who went on strike um, and, uh, and against the poor working conditions and the unfair wages within the city's largest industry, um, uh, which was the textile industry. Um, and sometimes they, they pro uh, sometimes they labored 65 to 75 hours a week. Um, and they um, were obliged to provide their own needles, threads, knives, irons, occasionally even their own sewing machines. Um, and they were paid less than men. Um, and they were actually locked inside the factory. So um, they were, um, you know, protesting all these uh, social um, conditions. Um, so, whoops. Uh, so, um, and this was the, uh, the, the women, um, Came together, um, and as you can see here, these are working class women, but they have are wearing um, very um, their Sunday best. Um, so once again, this Sunday best comes up in which they're wearing their you know, their big hats and their most kind of sophisticated clothing, and this is a way of symbolizing their claiming of uh, being a, um, uh, a a woman a, a, in um, a full citizen. In, in, uh, and as a full worker with rights. Um, so using the fashion to instigate, to, to show um, th their status in society, to cement their status in society. Um, so, um, and to create their identity as, as workers. So um, I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go much more quickly. Um, so I also wanted to mention Gandhi. <laughs> So um, basically, Gandhi um, uh, started um, wearing the traditional uh, loincloth um, uh, and as a resistance to the, um, the, uh, the uh, British Empire and their kind of uh, taking over of the um, cotton industry and the textile industry. And he wore it um, to identify himself with the poor of India. Um, but, and then he also, uh, he, he encouraged um, people to discard their uh, European clothing um, and to um, start wearing the more traditional clothing. Um, uh, and that it was also a form of um, providing for uh, economic independence. So no longer being dependent on the textile imports um, that were coming uh, to India, but to have to maintain the textile industry in India. Um, so um, I want to now I want to um, uh, talk a little bit about the civil rights movement. So um, uh, so um, there were three strategic looks that came through the civil rights and black power um, movement. Um, one was the Sunday best that has been used before. Um, uh, that, um, uh, and then where there was also the denim dungarees and overalls, which was uh, completely um, very related to Gandhi in that it was a symbolizing of a relationship to the working class and the poor. And then the Black Panthers who also developed their own look. So um, first of all, the Sunday best um, was uh, uh, used by the civil rights um, uh, 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 marchers um, to kind of claim their status as a full, as full uh, citizens. Um, and uh, the to um, the worthy of the dignity and the respect that um, were challenged um, in the uh, institutions of the day. And so by wearing these suits, they kind of claim this status within society. Um, and then um, there also the dungarees was uh, more another part of the movement, which was 
more claiming uh, affinity with the sharecroppers um, and the poor. And so reclaiming this uh, the symbolism of subservience uh, uh, that is conveyed through the dungarees as a statement of power. Um, and also as a way of bringing more people into the movement because it created this uh, and other affinity um, for people. And then the and the final um, aspect is this um, uh, the Black Panthers who developed a more kind of another kind of uniform. And this one was a, a little bit more um, militant. So um, there was the black leather jackets, the, the black pants, and then the beret, um, which was something that came from um, the French uh, resistance, the, the use of the beret. And so this is a distinctly military look. Um, and But it was also kind of a, a, a resistance to the status quo and a new kind of claiming of power. Um, so all of these different elements um, and these different uh, ways of projecting yourself through fashion on the street became super important in the civil rights movement. Um, so in other um, uh, uh, protests, um, social change movement was the Black is Beautiful movement. And this started um, in the, in, uh, with a fashion show in Harlem um, called Naturally 2062. Uh, um, and basically what it did was it promoted um, a very natural aesthetic for, for uh, African uh, women of African, well, everyone of African-American descent, but in particular, um, the, the hairstyle um, and the clothing. Um, so to, as you can see here, they're um, you know, wearing um, African uh, textiles um, and they are, their hair is natural. At, at the time it was very considered um, appropriate for women um, to straighten their hair and to, uh, to try and mimic uh, white um, uh, beauty standards. And so this was uh, a way for the women to say, no, this is our beauty standard and to be out in, in public in, in, um, and showing the beauty of, of their natural way of being and refusing to kind of try and conform to uh, other um, beauty standards. Um, and uh, so it was, it was also, um, similar to Gandhi, it's all about self-sufficiency and supporting your community um, and uh, uh, cutting ties of dependency on those outside of your community. So um, also uh, uh, there's another protest um, strategy, which is message t-shirts and jackets. And this, these are super impactful because they have an immediately understandable uh, messages um, and that you can all use in strategic moments um, or where they can be photographed or um, on television. Um, and so it, uh, so it and it lets the the body convey a message um, uh, without, um, uh, you know, having to speak. So it's a very powerful uh, visual statement. So, um, and this is a, a protest, uh, this protest uh, um, t-shirt um, uh, was popularized by uh, Catherine uh, Hamnet. Um, she was an English fashion designer um, who uh, reached a cult-like status when, uh, because of this a photograph in which she met with Margaret Thatcher and she wore this shirt, 58% uh, don't want perishing. Um, and this was to um, highlight the public uh, um, opposition to putting US perishing missiles in the UK. And so um, uh, it made the image um, because she was with Margaret Thatcher, she was wearing this shirt, it made the front page of major newspapers. And so this was her way of, of um, advocating for social change and protesting um, using the media and using fashion. Um, and I just, I wanted to go back in history once again to show the similarity between the uh, shirt strike, um, shirt waist uh, strike, um, strikers, um, and to show the very almost similar font and very similar um, look to, uh, to between the two images. I um, thought that was quite striking. Um, and then in other um, 
uh, uh, message uh, jacket. This time happened in um, during the AIDS crisis in the United States. There was an artist who um, basically uh, wore this um, jacket to a protest, and he was actually um, in the background of some television projections. Um, so he was seen on television. So his statement um, could be read by many um, on television. And so it was a very powerful use of fashion um, in, in a time of protest when they were advocating for um, more research and more resources to be um, dedicated to resolving the AIDS crisis, which was affecting so many people um, uh, at that time. So um, also, uh, this is a, a piece by Dainties, which um, uh, also challenges the stereotypical notions of women and love. And so um, it's kind of a progression of that uh, messaging t-shirt. So um, I have a sense that we're running out of time. So I'm gonna just ask, So um, we have uh, textile as fine art. Um, so uh, this is uh, just um, uh, a re uh, reintroducing of textiles into the um, fine art. So women uh, began to kind of counteract um, the uh, in the seventies um, this. Uh, sexist art world um, by recognizing domestic arts and they found um, kind of unique power. Um, okay. Okay, so sorry, I was worried about the time running out, but we still have about um, 18 minutes. Um, so calm down a little bit. So um, we have uh, the um, uh, uh, so um, back to the textiles as uh, fine art. Um, so uh, women who are working in the arts um, were reclaiming their power and reclaiming their unique position um, by introducing textiles, because as we said at the beginning, textiles and women and women's work has been very closely tied for um, uh, uh, since since almost the beginning. And so to, to kind of reintroduce this uh, techniques and the skills of textile production into the contemporary museum, museum environment was, was quite radical. Um, and so, um, and it, it was this very symbolic of femininity. Um, and uh, so it's actually uh, Judy Chicago who coined the term feminist art in the 1970s and established the first uh, feminist art program at the uh, California Institute of the Arts. And she uh, specialized in teaching the fiber arts, um, like weaving and yarn, and um, ultimately helped to build um, and oversee a much more uh, kind of the whole introduction of the, the textile arts in, in the museum settings and in the uh, fine arts in general. Um, so, um, so let's move on to the, um, uh, another technique, um, a protest technique that's been used. So we have the uh, craftivism and craft and activism. Um, so basically it's a branch of activist art that you, is used to raise awareness for social justice issues and uh, forms of radical craft work have uh, been popularized by women and marginalized people as a form of peaceful protest. Um, and sometimes crafts speak louder than words. And so this um, part of this uh, came out um, with the, uh, the suffragettes um, with their handmade uh, banners. And this whole idea kind of contrasted um, the domestic environment and the skills that um, the women had and used them to kind of claim rights in a larger society. Um, and so um, one of the um, uh, big um, uh, craftivism projects, I, uh, 
I don't know what, I don't want to say it's a, uh, the first, but it's definitely one of the, the most significant um, was the, the, uh, the AIDS quilt. Um, and this came also in the wake of the AIDS crisis when um, many people were dying and the, uh, the government in the United States was doing very little to, um, uh, to bring some kind of solution to the problem. And so there was huge process around the United States and the, um, the AIDS quilt became this nationwide symbol of the tragedy of being people losing their lives um, and losing uh, members of their family and their friends networks to AIDS and to demand action from the government. Um, so the, the, and the quilt also became a powerful um, educator and a symbol for social justice. Um, and it's, it's a way of storytelling. So each of the quilts um, was, um, created um, in the memory of somebody who had died of AIDS. Um, and um, it, so it's a way of storytelling. It's a way of, of kind of making things more human um, and for to change hearts and minds, to, to give a pers personified um, element to the, um, uh, to the, um, the AIDS crisis. Um, and so um, most of the, uh, here you can see they, uh, presented them in Washington, D.C., and um, most of the quilts are um, uh, like a three by six um, panel, so this is kind of the size of a coffin, so they use this um, kind of uh, another layer of symbolism, and there's something about the craft and the care and the um, kind of time that goes into something like this that really adds to its weight and to its like its poignancy because it's so, there's so much time and dedication that's put into um, these pieces that the impact of just one is super powerful, but then on a, on a massive scale, this um, this is was a, a major kind of uh, installation, public space installation that really, um, I think had a powerful impact on um, uh, uh, the, the government and, and uh, on individual people. So, and m many were individually crafted by people whose friends and family had died. So it was really added um, like this uh, kind of um, uh, scale of, of, the, um, of the crisis um, visually, which sometimes is very hard to do. And so this was a way that uh, this was done. And it also kind of brought people together because each quilt, um, people, a group of people could work on together. And this is another thing that we find is quite um, important in developing uh, protest and social change is developing a network uh, and a community around the issues. So I um, want to, uh, we also, um, then we also have uh, uh, knit bombing and public space installations that make a statement about changing the way we look at things. So yard bombing um, started in the 2005 in Houston with a woman named Magda Saige who um, uh, created her first knit bombing, uh, yard bombing, yarn bombing uh, uh, artwork. And she basically uh, started a movement. <laughs> so I, um, I, I don't know if anyone's watching, but if you have any comments or questions, please do put them in the chat. And as soon as I'm, we're finished with this, I'm gonna take a look and hopefully we'll be able to discuss some of it. So yarn bombing is a part street art, part graffiti, um, part activism, and it combines a seemingly cute um, and comforting elements of knitting and crocheting uh, with revolutionary and um, uh, uh, it's kind of a mild form of uh, civil disobedience. It's kind of a way of being out in public um, with a message. Um, and so um, you can... Uh, 
it's like a way of staking a claim in a very corporate dominated environment, um, just like graffiti. Um, and But it's also a very feminist um, way of uh, being in the city, a very feminine way of being in the city. So it's, it kind of brings all these elements together of kind of challenging some of the status quo, questioning your environment, getting a way of people looking at things differently. Um, and also a lot of times there would be crews of uh, women working together even with their own street names um, who would go out into the city and kind of claim space through their um, knit bombing. Um, so this is a fun uh, way that fashion and textiles has been used to kind of be out in public and to raise awareness and, and craft an identity. So um, one of my favorite pieces is uh, from a Danish artist um, who uh, created this um, beautiful uh, cover for a tank as a kind of a symbol, um, uh, you know, kind of taking this uh, very uh, like a heavy and um, uh, kind of crude, forceful, aggressive image and turning it into something completely playful and light um, with the color pink and this little kind of like mini cannonball kind of thing, pom-pom hanging off instead of like, you know, sh shooting whatever they shoot, you know, missiles. Um, so it's really a beautiful statement of kind of, you know, cr creating this kind of juxtaposition of the images and the, um, the, the militaristic and then this more feminine, soft approach, a playful approach can have. Um, another favorite was just happened this year in Singapore was these huge uh, crocheted um, installations, um, kind of mimicking um, the sea creatures, sea urchins, which is, is very quite beautiful, but it also kind of puts you in a different relationship to the sea and makes you think more about uh, kind of the sea environment that so many of us are surrounded by and dependent on, but yet we often ignore. And so bringing it into this monumental scale is a quite beautiful uh, um, uh, uh, statement. Um, so another uh, protest movement uh, with textiles is um, the Tiny Pricks Project. And so this was a movement that started in the United States um, after Donald Trump was elected. Um, as I think maybe some of you know, there was the, the suggestion that the, Donald Trump had tiny hands and that of course was an indicator of his tiny other uh, parts of his body. And so this beautiful project um, emerged called the Tiny Pricks Project. It was created by Diana Weimar. And um, it was kind of uh, uh, what they started off, it's expanded a bit, but it initially started with embroidering of um, Donald Trump's Twitter statements um, into handmade textiles. And so it was this kind of contrast of materiality of the Twitter or just shooting it off, you know, like for, uh, to the embroidering, which takes time and it takes, you know, and to really cement those um, tweets that he was um, making that were sometimes so outrageous um, or things that he was saying and that we just float by and people would forget but to really cement them in this textile. Um, so it kept the spirit, it created a community um, and they were building an archive of his crazy statements. Um, and it was also a creative outlet, a way of people coming together. So here's just a few examples. So this was something that um, Donald Trump said that people found quite offensive. So um, instead of it floating away into the, the you know, digital internet, it kind of became solidified here. And so there's a website where you can go, where you can see all of these um, uh, with all the uh, more outrageous things that uh, Donald Trump said. And, and then there's also this one that came um, after he, uh, he made a, um, a statement around um, the uh, some countries being shithole countries in a, in a, in a meeting. Um, so just to kind of, you know, kind of keep a public record of some of the things he was saying and to, to hold him accountable to, to, to what he was um, saying. Um, so, um, another, um, 
way that uh, textiles became a part of a protest movement was also in response to Donald Trump. And this uh, was the pink pussy hat, which um, was uh, uh, became a huge symbol of uh, women in uh, protest to the misogynistic um, president that had been elected. Um, and so uh, the, the beautiful thing about this is that it was a very simple design that they made available on online and people could um, uh, make it quite easily, um, but also women, um, mostly women, but men as well, formed in groups to knit these together. So it was a way of um, building community. So there would be pink pussy hat um, knitting parties. Um, and then, of course, there was the huge um, demonstration, the March on Washington, in which they all came together. And it, it created this um, oop, uh, amazing um, visual statement as well, hearkening back to the whites of the suffragettes and of the NWACP um, silent protests in New York in the beginning of the uh, 19th century and then uh, 1900s. Um, so this is a, another use of color, but also of making a very accessible and easy um, way for people to take on the uh, uniform of protest. Um, and we have the same, of course, with the Yellow Vest Movement, um, which is a movement that ar arose in France um, in uh, 2018 as a kind of a protest. It was a weekly protest that took place against um, economic injustice, but then also advocating for um, political reforms. Um, and they were kind of... Um, gathering in the streets against the rising cost of crude oil and fuel prices and also the high cost of living um, and economic equality. So these vests were kind of the perfect symbol because they are actually um, re, uh, a symbol of the working class, uh, the construction workers and things like this, but also they are a part of every um, car, the required car uh, safety kit <laughs> so every every French person who had a car, they would have uh, access to one of these vests. So it was um, a kind of a perfect protest tool because it, so many could easily join in. Um, and it also created um, a, a, an amazing um, visual statement. And, and once again, like being very cognizant of the uh, use of social media and having a, a, a visual impact in, in the media. And other, okay, so yes, yeah, so I, as I said, easily accessible, um, very symbolic of the working people and highly visible. Um, so, and, and other movement um, is the green tide, which uh, was in Argentina that um, uh, after 30 years of um, advocating for abortion rights, they um, got it in uh, December 30th of 2020. And this green kerchief became a symbol of their movement um, and, and a very powerful symbol um, of this 30 year struggle to gain these rights. And interestingly, now that those rights have been taken away from um, American women, um, they, um, they have been, uh, using the same green symbol to come into the streets and to advocate for their rights over their bodies. So this is another use of textiles and fabrics and to um, raise awareness around issues and to create community and make a visual statement. So um, I'm just gonna do another time check. Okay, so, um, and then the last um, kind of example I want to show before I kind of um, uh, show a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about cre creating our own campaigns um, is uh, this uh, uh, rebirth garments. Um, and this is uh, a movement uh, that um, is, uh, let me see if I have the name of the, I actually don't have the name of the, the main artist. Uh, here, but um, she, uh, she's an American uh, fashion designer um, that is working with uh, radical visibility. Um, and uh, so uh, she is working uh, with a gender, gender non-conforming um, 
bodies uh, 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 is, uh, and um, also size and um, ability. And so kind of using fashion to raise awareness and build community around um, parts of the uh, society that are usually not um, a part of the fashion industry and the fashion industry and to um, to raise awareness, to, to make them more visible as a way to nurture community um, from people who have been excluded from mainstream fashion. Um, and so um, uh, she has this uh, amazing uh, uh, fashion sense um, and uh, she is building a, like an identity that is queer, um, disabled, um, gender non-conforming, um, and has a, a apparent and non-apparent um, disabilities. So both physical disabilities, but then also mental um, and uh, psychological, developmental. So all of these are included in the, um, the visibility is to make these bodies and, and these ways of, of being in society more visible and more, um, uh, 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 definitely more visible, <laughs> um, but also creating an identity and a pride uh, um, uh, uh, by creating a community around this. So, um, and in particular, they focus on trans and disabled communities um, and the clothes are designed to kind of highlight and 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 work uh, uh, to actually um, uh, uh, what would you say um, kind of uh, not exaggerate but kind of like promote or e even exaggerate I guess um, some of these uh, rather than try and hide them or conform, it's to be more visible and more proud and more accepting um, in, in a public way of um, bodies that are, have traditionally been unacceptable. Um, so uh, so um, you can see this, uh, that they have these amazing designs and then also they have uh, these uh, dance parties. So they have videos of the dance parties. So it's about combining fashion, community and uh, raising awareness and having fun and being together in, in fun and uh, creative ways. So um, I, uh, I am really sorry that I don't have her name. Um, but you can look it up. The, this is the um, URL, the rebirthgarments.com. And it, it's a super uh, great project. And I think you can see the joy um, of the people who are involved in it. And having um, having done my own projects where I do um, design clothes spe uh, specifically for um, the, uh, the individual bodies, I, I know how like how it, that's a transformative experience for many people who are used to just going into kind of a standard shop and just buying kind of what's ever there and never feeling kind of like that their own body is special and looking at their own body as something that uh, you know has its own unique elements um, that can be featured and highlighted and catered to. So I, I think this is a, is a super beautiful project. Um, so um, as a way of moving into the next components of the um, this live stream, um, we are going to, uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the elements of uh, building uh, a social uh, change, uh, social protest movement. Um, so some of, uh, some of this it begins with solidarity and building community around the issues, finding other people who care about the, the same things that you care about um, and working together. Um, so we, I've seen this in uh, many of the examples that I've shown. Um, and uh, so even traditionally, like the sewing circles and the quilting bees and the times when women came together and shared skills, it was also a time for them to uh, share stories about their lives, um, to kind of have a space outside of the patriarchy to build bonds and to um, come up with ideas. And so this is this solidarity has often happened um, you know, in, a, in oppressed groups um, through the, the production of textiles. Um, so uh, 
So also to create a group will also build your strength and reach and help to build a network. And um, it's also a way of sharing resources and strategies. Um, it's a way of feeling connected that you are not alone, you are not isolated. Um, also that the, if you're engaging in a, um, in a creative uh, practice through the making, there's a meditative thoughtfulness peace of mind that comes with this creation. Um, it's also an embracing of a more traditional uh, feminine approach. And it's also a way to kind of uh, build your voice um, by working collectively and to not remain silently, uh, not remain silent. And so it's, it's a way for more people to stand together. So this is an important aspect of social uh, change. Although there are, you know, that some of these movements are started by individuals, but there's always, it seems to be a community that builds around it. Um, so this is a, a, a something that I want to suggest that we think about when we're building our campaign. Um, so also we have, um, uh, so for some things to consider when you're uh, starting your own DIY activism um, is to kind of think about how it can be both personal and collective or um, uh, how it can have a visual impact, um, how it can be uh, used to create, uh, create unity and also connect to history. Um, and then we have the... Um, uh, uh, thinking about the media um, and also kind of thinking about how what you can do that can be a local, um, national or international or some combination of all of them. Um, and then uh, definitely social media, how do you reach a, your audience? So I think like um, the Tiny Pricks project is a really great example of something small and intimate, and then it's just becoming more and more, more and more people seeing it on Instagram and sharing it and then contributing. Um, and I think they have over 10,000 um, submissions of, uh, you know, these small um, kind of mini protest statements that in their time, with all of them become this massive kind of archive, very powerful. And then, um, so also to be very visible, uh, uh, to kind of show what it looks like. So for example, when you hear sustainability, body, body positive, queer, local, DIY, fair trade, whatever, maybe one of the issues that you care about um, related to the fashion industry, um, what, what does it look like? So kind of being, a, kind of thinking about the visual side of things. Um, and then also taking from the activist art kind of um, mantra that you take something you copy it and you distribute. So how can we use that of giving people things to take um, and copy and distribute? So thinking about that model of distribution and reaching an audience. And then finally also like color and design uh, fashion, how is that? It's such an um, image driven uh, business. So, you know, we can use fashion in that way too. So, um, so, now is the, at the time for us to be thinking about how we could design our own campaign. And those who are um, gonna be in the WhatsApp group, um, we will talk about that. Um, but uh, when you're thinking about designing your um, campaign, um, first of all, it, you know, clarify your issue. What are the, uh, the talking points, the main information you want to share? Um, what are the levels of engagement? Um, that you um, uh, um, want people to uh, participate in with your um, campaign. Um, and uh, um, uh, so, um, the, so basically being very clear about the information that you want pe uh, to, to share. So defining your issue, um, then the levels of engagement um, the simple things everyone can do to be um, uh, more involved or, or to take a leadership role. Um, so, uh, okay. So, um, uh, okay. So then we also have the um, slogan, the catchphrase. Um, so oftentimes it's good to have a phrase that's um, 
uh, people will remember and can identify with. Visuals, think through the visuals, think through your media, and think through the location where it's going to happen, and think about accessibility, how to make it accessible to most people. So um, I'm going to now uh, switch to see if what's happening, um, if anybody, there's been any comments um, from you all watching it. Uh, so it seems like there's been no comments, no questions. So, um, uh, so now we're gonna um, gonna show a um, a video, which is kind of the some of the past um, uh, projects that I have done, um, uh, and uh, those are the, like a swap um, days and. Um, uh, creative reuse festivals and a lot of this fashion show project, um, the House of Refashion. So um, this is to just give you an idea of some of the projects I've been working on and how they're related to social change um, and uh, especially around uh, the fashion industry. Um, and uh, uh, so, um, uh, I hope that that's enjoyable for people. Um, if you have any questions, please, or comments, please do put them in the live stream here, um, chat in the live stream chat. And for those of you who are in the um, participatory workshop, um, we'll be going uh, to, we'll be meeting in our Zoom meeting um, soon. Um, as soon as the video starts, we'll go to the Zoom meeting. So, um, uh, I'm going to, um, uh, uh, I guess, I don't know, there's not much more to say. <laughs> um, uh, so we'll, we'll wait for this video to start and we will um, then uh, hopefully we'll have time at the end to present the, uh, the group, uh, the Zoom groups uh, ideas for social media campaign. I'm using some of the techniques that we've discussed, discussed here, this kind of history of all the, um, uh, the ways that fashion and social change um, and protest have been intertwined and to um, give people a chance to see how we can use these similar techniques or new techniques to advocate for things that we care about. So, um, uh, yeah, so we'll be uh, starting this video fairly soon. Um,
That's where we were. Fashion show backstage. <laughs> Models and crew. I guess I'm the crew. A little bit of behind the scenes. Live from Athens. It's the most secret of all secret rooms in communities and the heart of the show. What makes you the most excited? I always wanted to be a model. Okay. Uh, I'm excited um, to wear this cap. Uh -huh. It's perfect. I love the clothes. Yeah. So do you know, are, are you doing it live already? Yeah. You can get the dog wearing the tie. So this is the backstage. Backstage of Cognitive is a free fashion show for a post-capitalist world. Or imaginary even. Yeah, I don't know when start. Hi Germans! You are a splendid model. How do you feel? It's very tiring to be perfect. Communitism offers so many experiences on I such like a small space. Cheese. The energy and the expectation is almost palpable.
Uh, so, uh, hello again. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us or joining me. <laughs> um, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed the video. And if you, anybody has any questions or comments or wants to get in touch, um, uh, my Instagram is House of Refashion. And um, you can also send an email to House of Refashion at gmail.com. Uh, uh, I hope that some of these ideas were inspiring to you and um, perhaps will um, help you in starting your own campaigns to raise awareness about issues that you care about uh, using fashion and textiles and some of the other ideas of um, what were presented earlier and, um, and that I also hope that the video was enjoyable for everyone. It's been a uh, great experience to be here on the live stream and yeah I'm I'm quite uh, uh, happy to um, have been able to participate in this conference and I hope that the rest of the workshops and presentations uh, both the live stream and the in-person go very well and uh, great I'm uh, thank you for um, uh, participating able to participate in this conference so um, yeah, I, I'm going to be signing off now. And I think there's a, another program coming up after mine. So I hope you that you enjoy that as well.